Praise the Lord, all the nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Oh, well, that's what we're gathered to do, isn't it? To praise the Lord. Uh, that, that's our primary purpose. And one of the reasons we do that, well, it's there for us in the psalm. His steadfast love, his covenant faithfulness toward us is great. And don't we know that? Haven't we seen how much he loves his people? How willing he is to enter a relationship with them, to create a covenant with them, whereby he has bound himself to his people. And he did that for us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the means of his death for our sin on the cross. And God is faithful. He will keep his word that all who trust in his son for the forgiveness of sin will be forgiven, will be brought into his everlasting kingdom. Isn't it right that we should praise the Lord? Well, I'm going to do that for us now. Let us pray. Lord our God, as we come before you, we acknowledge you as great God and Father of us all. We acknowledge you as the only true and living God, the one who has shown us his love for us. Oh yes, Father, you in all your perfections have shown us that you want to be in a right relationship with us, despite our failings, despite our continued backsliding, yet still you desire for us to be drawn to yourself. And you have drawn us to yourself. You have granted us an understanding by your Holy Spirit of who your son Jesus is and what he has done. That through him our sin is forgiven as he died for it on the cross. Through him we have his righteousness put to our account. Through him we've been able to repent of our sin and turn to you. Oh, but how often we continue to fall short of the glory that you have for us. And yet, Father, you have made a way for us to be forgiven. Continually, we are able to confess our sin before you and have the promise of a restoration with you. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you that this is the case. We thank you that it doesn't rely on us to do anything to make up for our shortcomings. For we could not. They lie so heavily upon us and they stand in stark contrast to who you have called us to be. And so we are so grateful that uh, even when we are stubborn and strong-willed and turn against you, yet you are there ready to forgive us, not because we can make up for it, not because of anything that is good in us, but because Jesus paid the price. He paid the penalty of death that we deserve. And so we are forgiven. And so we have the promise of life everlasting in his name. Oh, how good this is. And this day, Father, may we be those who remember all your great good gifts to us and praise you and give you thanks and worship you because of what you have done for us in Jesus. O Lord our God, we also ask that your spirit would be with us, transforming us, drawing us into a better understanding of your word so that we might become more and more your people reflecting your glory. And be with us as we are drawn to one another by that same spirit. That we might be those who show love for one another. O Lord our God, we pray these things in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing our first song. It's number 61 in your hymn books. The Lord is King.
open your Bibles to uh, the book of Samuel. I've got two readings from Samuel this morning. Uh, for now, we're just going to look at Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 8 and verses 1 to 18. Uh, and we'll be reading from chapter 10 in a little while later. Uh, but for now, let's look at 1 Samuel 8 verses 1 to 18. And that's on page 272 of the Pew Bibles. So 1 Samuel chapter 8, reading from verse 1. This is the word of our God. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us, like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who are asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plough his ground and reap his harvest and make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Let us come to the Lord our God as we come to him in prayer, as we pray for the needs of uh, our church. Let us bring our needs before him. There are some prayer points on the back of your pew sheets. Take those home uh, and pray them during the week. Uh, let us pray. O Lord our God, we thank you and praise you once more that you have called us together this day. We thank you for the open invitation that you have given us through Christ to make our needs known to you. Though in your word you tell us that you know what we have need of even before we ask or think it. What a glorious God you are, that you know us so well. What a glorious God that you are in that you have provided for us so well. Not just this day, but we see the way that you have provided for us in every way throughout our entire lives. Especially that you have given us your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that in him we have the promise of everlasting life. O oh Lord our God, we ask that you would be with this your people, whom you have called and chosen, that you would establish us in our faith, that you would continue to make us a light in a dark place, especially in the community in which you have placed us, that we might be those who are ready and willing to reach out to others, to tell them of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is life to be had, that salvation is on offer, that we no longer need to be slaves to our sin, but that we can be forgiven, we can enter a new life, with you, be given clean hearts. 
O Lord our God, we pray that we would be diligent and faithful servants as we take this message out to the world around us. We pray, Father, that you would do a mighty work by your spirit amongst the people uh, whom we live, that they would too would hear these words of, of good news and be transformed by your spirit, be born again to a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you will continue to establish this church, establish this congregation. Help us to be those who seek to bring glory to your name in all that we say, do and think. We pray especially, Father, for those who are part of our number, who are going through very difficult and trying times. Those who have problems with their health, Oh Lord God, this morning we do pray, especially for Elizabeth, but we continue to pray for Bill Cole. And we ask your hand upon him and Jan as they go through what is an extraordinarily trying time. We thank you, Father, that their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is unmovable and unshakable. But we also pray, Father, that you would continue to provide them with hope, and surround them with love. We also pray that you would bring comfort and ease to the symptoms that Bill is feeling this day. That he might be relieved of the ill effects of what is ailing him at this time. We pray, Father, for those who are grieving. We do remember Merle in our prayers and Dorothy and their families. And we ask that you would surround them with your love and care and support. And that where we can, we would also be the instruments of your love and your grace to them. And your comfort. That they would know that you are the one who is surrounding them and providing for them. We pray, Father, for those who are facing other difficulties. Whether it be stress with work or anxiety about finances. Or whether it is depression for whatever reason. Lord our God, be the one who provides hope. Let, our, let us cast our anxieties and our concerns into your hands, knowing that you have provided us with all that we need in Christ Jesus. That in him we have the promise of life, yes, now and for eternity. That through Jesus we learn that you are the one who delights to provide for your people. And so we pray, provide for those who are feeling anxious and stressed and depressed. Give them hope. Give them the promise and remind them of the promises that you have given them. That you will be with them and you will provide for them. May we all learn this lesson and take it to heart that we might not fall into the danger of relying on ourselves or on the things of this world. But let us cast ourselves upon you that you would be the one who offers and provides for your people. We pray, Father, for the continuing work of your word in the world that it might go out with great power, not just in our own nation, but in every nation. We pray for a new awakening, a new enlivening of your spirit across nations. That people would turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or some would who would come to trust in him for the first time. That there would be a great movement towards Christ and not away from him. We pray for our brothers and sisters facing persecution in different places around the world. That you would be their strength, that you would be their shield, that you would be their protector. And that their faith would not waver in the face of such persecution. We pray for those who are facing the hardship of war. And we think of those in Israel and Gaza. We think of those in uh, Ukraine as well. And we ask, God, that you would be the one to bring an end to these wars in such a way that people would see that it's your hand at work. 
But in all of this, Father, may your people rise up to the challenge of providing for those who are displaced, who are grieving, who are saddened, who have lost so much. Oh, Lord our God, may your people rise up and be the very image of Christ in these places and to these people that you might be known and you might be glorified and praised. Oh, Lord our God, we pray all these things in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> uh, we're going to sing again. Uh, this time we're singing number 491 in your hymn books. And as we sing this song, May the Mind of Christ My Saviour, we will be collecting the offering. Now, if you're visiting, we, we don't uh, require you to give anything to our offering. The gospel is free and you are here to share in it. Um, but we will remain seated for the first four verses and stand for the last verse. pray once more. Lord our God, we thank you for the way that you provide for us here in this church amongst this congregation. We pray, Father, that you will continue to shed your blessing upon us, that we might know your presence among us, that we might be equipped to serve you, not just with the gifts that we return to you this day, but with our very lives, that all that we say and do would be given over to the work of your kingdom. Oh Lord our God, we pray that you would do this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's open our Bibles again, and this time just go over the page to 1 Samuel chapter 10 on page 275, uh, and we'll be reading from verses 17 through to verse 27. So that's 1 Samuel 10. Verses 17 through to verse 27. So let us hear the word of the Lord once more. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians from the, and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans and the clan of the Matrites was taken by Lot. And Saul the son of Kish was taken by Lot. 
but when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. And they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among the people. And the people shouted, Long live the king! Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah. And with him went men of valour whose hearts God had touched. But some worthless fellows said, How can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present. But he held his peace. Well, let us pray once more as we explore God's word together today. And I'm trying to encapsulate a lot today. I'm, I'm going from 1 Samuel 8 to the end of chapter 11. So I'm trying to capture a lot that's going on here. Um, but let us pray to God before we get into it. Let's pray. Lord our God, we ask that you would be with us this day, that your Holy Spirit would dwell among us, that he would open our ears and our hearts to receive your word, that we may know your teaching, that we may be equipped to live according to your rule and your word. We ask, Father, that this will be the work that you do in us today, for we ask it in Jesus. Amen. There's advice in abundance about how to be a good leader. Uh, you can find in bookshops all over the place dozens of books on leadership. Ten steps to become a better leader can be found on hundreds of different websites. You can go out and attend seminars and conferences and courses about being a good leader. And even in the Christian realm, I think I've got about six books on the topic of leadership from a Christian perspective. Now, people need good leadership. I've got no doubt about that. And I don't think the Bible leaves us in any doubt that we need good leadership. Now, what should we look for in a good leader? And more importantly, what should Christians look for in a leader? In 1 Samuel 8, we see the people of Israel in crisis once again. Samuel's getting older. His sons, well, they're no good. It's a bit like we've got Eli 2.0 going on, isn't it? Do you remember Eli? And he had two sons, Phineas and Hophni, who were wicked high priests, who perverted uh, the worship of God and caused the people to stumble and dishonor God. Well, it seems like Samuel's sons aren't much better. Uh, we are told that they took bribes and perverted justice. And so we see the beginning of an era where kings will rule over Israel at the people's request. So as we explore these very early days, as we follow through Saul's pathway to the throne of Israel, we're going to notice some helpful signposts as we think about leadership. And we'll explore the motives of the people. We'll see some positive signs as Saul approaches the throne of Israel and we see some early events in Saul's leadership that give us hope that maybe this would be a good leader. But we do all this in a quest to discover who is the leader that God's people really need. So first thing we see, the people are asking for a king, but for all the wrong reasons. The elders in verse 4 of 1 Samuel 8 declare that with Samuel's sons taking bribes and perverting justice, that they do not make good leaders. And, and that's right, and that's true. The people have, have accurately described the situation and accurately said, it's not good enough. We want better leadership 
than this. And it's always right to call bad leadership to account. But instead of asking Samuel to pray for the Lord, now of course Samuel does pray, they say, verse 5, appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. And that displeases Samuel. Because look at the motive. Why do they want a king, or to judge us, that's fine, like all the nations? And herein lies the problem. The people look around them, they see the power of the Philistines. And they have kings. They see the power of the Ammonites around them. And the Ammonites have a king. And so they begin to think, well, if we too have a king, maybe we too will be powerful. It seems that these people have a very short memory. Just in the previous chapter, in 1 Samuel 7, we saw what happens when the people turn with all their hearts to honour God and serve God and serve only God. And, to do it, and they do it well. What happens in 1 Samuel 7? God wins the battle for them. Even as they're offering up sacrifices, God defeats the people's enemies and wins the battle for them. He is the one who will go out to war for his people when they serve and honour him rightly. But these people seem to have a short memory. It seems that some time has passed since that event where God destroyed the Philistines by his mighty hand. And these people, they don't ask for a king that God would provide. They don't have any confidence that God could remove the bad leaders that they've got in Samuel's sons. They rely only on what they can do. Let us choose a king so that we might be like the nations around us. And Samuel, in his distressed state, comes before God and he's, and. and, and he must be saying something along the lines of God, they've rejected me. They've rejected my wisdom and my rule. And God says to him, no, Samuel. They have not rejected you. They've rejected me from being king over them. And in fact, God goes on in verse 8 saying that this is what his people have often done. This is what... Their modus operandi is, their MO, this is how they function. From the day that God brought them out of Egypt, this is what he says, verse 8, even to this day they have forsaken me and serve other gods. And now they're doing the same thing to do. They're rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting your wisdom, which I've given you. But they're not really rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And so obey their voice and show them the way of the king that will be like the nations around them. And look at this king. Look at what he will do. This king is a king who will take. He will take. Uh, if you read uh, verses 10 to 18, it's clear that this is a king that will take. He will take your sons. He will take your daughters. He will take the best of your fields. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards. He will take your male and female servants. He will take the best of your young men. He will take your donkeys. He will take a tenth of your flocks. He will take. That's what this king that you want, that, 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 that the nations around you have, this is what this king will do. He is a taker. How does that compare with the way God deals with his people? Well, have a look at what God has said to his people. And jump over to, to chapter 10 as we look at this. What does God say in verse 18 of chapter 10 
thus says the Lord God of Egypt, uh, the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. Do you see the difference? God, as he ruled over his people, gave. I gave you freedom from slavery. I gave you manna in the wilderness when you were hungry. When you were thirsty, I gave you water to drink. When you needed a land for yourselves, I gave you that land. When you were oppressed, I gave you victories. The Lord God gives or the king they want will take. Well, isn't that such a short memory that these people have? They ask to trade a generous and gracious God the true and living God for a king who will take from them. This is what they request. So that they can be like the nations around them. That's their motive. And it's a wrong motive. And what's worse, the last thing that Samuel says that this king will do, verse 17 of of 1 Samuel 8, what does he say that, that this king will do? He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. All the things that the people escaped when God brought them out of Egypt is everything that they are asking for now. All of the work that God had done, well, the people with their human goggles firmly fixed to their eyes see the only solution to the problem that they face of bad leadership is a human solution. And it's a bad solution. But don't we do that even as Christians? We take our eyes off God and look for human solutions to our problems. We think we need families to join us. Well, the solution is let's hold a fate or a fair in our church grounds. And that will bring families in. The theology that we have clashes with the culture around us. So too often... Christians adjust their theology so it fits with their culture. People love to be entertained and the solution is, well, then we'll hire professional professional musicians. We'll have a stage, we'll have lights, we'll have smoke machines. Because we want to be those who entertain because that's what they want. That's what the people want. And Christians can do this. We need more music and less talking because that's what people want. So let's do that. Give them what they want. Don't say anything controversial that clashes with our culture. Don't do anything that is different because you'll put people off. Oh, we need more youth. So we have a youth group that's focused on social activity instead of a youth group that is focused on growing in an understanding of who God is and what he's done for us through Jesus through the study of his word. See, when we see problems and difficulties, even as God's people, our first solution should never be human solutions. That's what the people of God were doing here. They had the wrong motives. We want to be liked. We want to be like the nations around us. We, we want to be the same. We want to fit in. Well, I don't think that's the right way. And think what God is declaring to his people there as he describes what this king will be like, as he reminds God's people of what he has done for them. He's saying, when you are different and you are honouring me, when you stand out, that is when you will receive blessing. Our first solution when we face problems, even as a Christian church, a body of God's people, should be to come to God, to delve deeper into his word, to confess our sin, 
when we see it, to engage more earnestly in prayer, to do the things that he's told us to do and to do it more and more. Because it is God who reigns over all things, and that should be especially so within his church. So we shouldn't be like the Israelites of Samuel's day, wanting to be like the, the world around us, wanting to be ruled in such a way that we become palatable to our community. We want to be different. We want to stand out because we are honouring God, doing things His way, according to His plan, under His rule and authority. We should look to God and seek him out first. And isn't that what Jesus tells us to do? When we've got anxieties and, and we're troubled and we're concerned about food or clothing, what does Jesus say in Matthew 6? In verse 32, he says, The Gentiles seek after all these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. First, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek the kingdom of God First, and his righteousness. Don't go after the world, go after God. That's the problem that the Israelites have. They had the wrong motives. They were going after the world instead of going after God. But there are some good signs here as Saul begins his journey to the throne of Israel. Now, we didn't read all of 1 Samuel 9, uh, but there's a whole episode about Saul being sent out by his father to look for donkeys. And all this is a setup by God to bring Saul and Samuel to the point where Samuel knows that Saul will be appointed as king. I want Samuel 10, as Saul meets with Samuel, Samuel says to him, Has not the Lord appointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the, over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. Can you see what, Saul, what Samuel's doing as, as Saul is appointed king? He's saying to him, you're under the Lord. You might be king, but don't let that go to your head. You're under the Lord. And so the Lord has anointed Saul. Well, that's a good start. The, Saul caused, the, the Lord caused Saul to meet with Samuel, and Samuel realises that this is the Lord's work. And Samuel then says there's going to be three signs for the first one being the donkeys that Saul is out looking for, they'll be found. And now Dad's concerned about his son. Where, where's Saul? The second sign is that he's going to meet three men carrying various goods. The third sign is that Saul will meet a group of prophets from Gibeath Elohim. And more importantly, Saul will have the spirit of the Lord rush upon him. And he will prophesy with these prophets. He will be turned into another man. Uh, that's what we read in 1 Samuel 9. Uh, and then, of course, these things do come to pass exactly the way that Samuel said they would, exactly the way that God had planned for them to come to pass. It seems that Saul, at least for the moment, is the instrument of the word of the Lord. And that's a, that's a good sign. It's a good sign. He's used by God to accomplish all these extraordinary things. In verse 9 of 1 Samuel 10. 1 Samuel 9, I should say. Verse 9 of 1 Samuel 9. No, verse 9 of 1 Samuel 10. I did have it right. <laughs> when, when Saul goes to leave Samuel, what happens? God gives him another heart. And all those signs came to pass. That sounds positive, doesn't it? Now Saul sounds like and looks like he's going to be one who is governed by the word of the Lord. So that looks all very promising. Saul is chosen by God, he's given the spirit of the Lord, he's transformed by God and even prophesies with the prophets of God. Maybe this king won't be so bad after all. It looks as though he will follow the word of God and do all the duty that God has set for a king to do. And by the way, God has provided a means for God's people to have a king. You see, the issue wasn't with 
the asking for a king, it's the way that it was asked. Because way back as far as Abraham in Genesis 17, God made this promise to Abraham. He says, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall no longer call her name Sarai, but Sarah will be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. There's already the thought all the way back in Genesis that there will be a king over God's people. But uh, also when Mo- with Moses. In Deuteronomy 17, God said to Moses, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I'll set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. So God makes provision for a king. It's not that, it's, that this is wrong to have a king. It's in the asking and in the motive that it was wrong. So there's provision A king that God chooses and not one that people want for themselves. And we see that even in the public choosing of a king to rule over them. 1 Samuel 10, which we read. It seems that God's hand is at work. The tribe of Benjamin was chosen by Lot. The tribe, uh, the clan of the Matrites was chosen by Lot. And then Saul was chosen by Lot. Everything that we see says that this is The work of the Lord. Saul is chosen. Now there's this incident where Saul can't be found. We don't have time to delve into the details of that, but it seems that he doesn't really want to be king at first. He's a reluctant uh, king. But Samuel says in verse 24, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among among all the people. So not only is this a king that you wanted... The one who's going to take. But he looks like a king, doesn't he? Doesn't he just look the part, everyone? Doesn't he look like the leader that you want? The one who's going to go out and win battles and fight for you? No, it's still chosen by the Lord, and it looks like that in the choosing of him, he seems to be the best choice. And certainly... Everything that we've seen shows us that he's been used by God, given the spirit of God, at least for a time, proclaiming the word of God. It looks good. There's some promising signs here. Everything outwardly looks very good. And then something extra is done for the king, verse 25 of 1 Samuel 10. Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And that, where did Samuel get this information? Deuteronomy 17. Uh, In Deuteronomy 17, God lays out what the king ought to be doing and what he ought not to be doing. And it says this, verse 16, he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire horses. He shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. See, these are the duties of a king. The duties of a king are to do what God has told him to do. To do all the commands of the Lord. To have the law right beside him. Read it all his days so he knows what the Lord wants him to do. That's his duty. That's his role. As king, he needs to do it and he needs to do it well. The king is to be a man who knows God, who reveres God, who seeks to do all that God has commanded. Will Saul be this kind of king? Will he always do what is right before the Lord? Well, he started well. There are some good signs, but will he finish well? That's the question. Now, if you know anything about the life of Saul as king, you'll know that he doesn't finish well. What the people need is a king that will do all that God asks of him and do it perfectly. Saul made a good start, but it wasn't perfect. At one point, he seemed to be hiding away from the work that he'd been called to do. 
And people need something better, someone better to be king. A good start is not good enough. What is needed is perfection from beginning to end. Now, thankfully, for those of us living on this side of the events of the life of Jesus of Nazareth, we know that there is a perfect king. One who has done all that God asked him to do and did it perfectly from beginning to end. One who rules with absolute authority, showing that he is king over this earth, over all who dwell in it, and even has authority over the wicked servants of the devil. We know that there is a king who has done this well, and that is King Jesus. He has shown us his absolute authority through his death and resurrection. By his death, he conquered sin. He defeated Satan, offered a better way to forgiveness. And by his resurrection, he declares his power over death and life. We need no other king than King Jesus. That is who we need. The challenge is that we too often look to worldly leaders. We want the pastor who has the young family so we can attract young families. We want the youth pastor in his 20s who is cool and and energetic so he can attract the youth. But what we really need, when we're looking at it with godly eyes, is King Jesus. We need him to guide us, to reign over us. We need to cast our care and concern upon him. We need to listen to him. We need to... Devote ourselves to him. Because God's plans for us in Christ are always perfect, always good, and always right. There's a further reason for seeing in Saul that perhaps he could be the king that Israel needs, and that's in 1 Samuel 11. Now, we didn't read any of that, but Saul goes out to do battle with the Ammonites. Uh, And there's a lot of references to significant towns and names here. For example, there's uh, the leader of the Ammonites is a man called Nahash, which is a Hebrew word that means serpent or snake. Uh, Are we seeing any connections there with anything in biblical history? Perhaps so. Um, uh, There's Jabesh Gilead, a town that was known as a town of traitors. Uh, There's the town called Gibeah, where Saul lives. And that was notorious for the worst atrocity in all of Israelite history. Even down to this day, it's still known for being the worst place where the worst atrocity ever occurred in Israelite history. So the Ammonites rise up against the people of Jabesh Gilead. They send for Saul at Gibeah. Saul sends a poisoned message to Israel. He chops up some oxen and sends them out to everyone and says, if you don't come and battle, this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, So all of Israel come out. They do battle. The Ammonites are defeated and destroyed. And it seems that Saul is not just going to be king that the people need, but the deliverer that they need as well. We're told that the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 11. And as he sent out his pointed message, these bits of oxen that he sent to everyone, the dread of the Lord fell upon the people of Israel. And after the battle, when the Kingdom is renewed in verse 13. Saul declares, today the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. It's all so promising. But there's a danger here. And I wonder if you see it. It's the danger that will bring about Saul's undoing. What begins with such a great reliance upon the Lord is soon forgotten. And instead, Saul, along with the people of Israel, begin to trust in their own abilities. Very soon the battles that Saul wins do not become victories for the Lord. They become victories for Saul. Very soon the adulation of the people that declares that the Lord has won the victory turns into a cry of adulation. Saul has won us the victory. Can you see what's happened? The Lord drops away. It's no longer the Lord. It is now all the focus on Saul and what he can do. Now, there's a warning for us here. As much as we think that our structures, our denomination, our decisions are based on prayerful consideration, that we've put under God what we think are good, godly people into the right positions within our church, we need to be on guard. Because when things go well, we cannot be tempted to fall in the trap of thinking that's because we had the right structures. We cannot fall into the trap of thinking it's because we've got the right pastor. 
We cannot fall into the trap of thinking that, we've because, that it's because we've got the good godly people in the right positions. When things go well, it's because God has given us blessing. It's never because of the human instruments that are put in place. It's always God who has done the right thing. It's not because we even had the right teaching or ran the right programs or had the right music or were in the right building. All these things that happen, that, that bring blessing to us, happen by the hand of God and nothing else. It's him who receives the glory, him who receives the praise, not our human instruments. We must never fail to honour God for what he does for us. And the greatest thing he's done for us is bringing us into his kingdom through his king, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's never the human instrument. It is always God through his king that he rules and that he gives and that he builds his kingdom. It's always through God. It's never up to our ingenuity. It's never up to our amazing abilities. It's always God. And hasn't he already shown it that he is the one in charge? Hasn't he already won the greatest battle that there is to be won? The defeat of sin, the defeat of Satan, the defeat of death. That is what has been won for us. And we are guaranteed victors when we trust in the work that Jesus has done for us on the cross that guarantees the victory over sin, Satan and death. And everything else that we get from God is by his grace. Oh yeah, we need a king. Don't be mistaken. We need good leadership. Don't be mistaken. But the leadership we need is perfect leadership through the perfect king, the Lord Jesus Christ. We shouldn't be looking to human instruments. We shouldn't be looking to please the world around us. We should be looking to Christ, who gives the victory, who has won the biggest battle that's ever been waged. Let us not second, settle for second best. Let us not be content with human solutions to our anxieties. But let's trust in the King, who has shown himself to be perfect, who has displayed his prowess in battle. Let's trust in Jesus. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you that you are the one who is reigning and ruling over all things and that through your son Jesus you have shown us that there is one king that we need above any human instrument and it's King Jesus. And Lord our God, help us to put all our trust and all our cares and all our concerns and all our hopes in him and in him alone knowing that he will do what is right and good for his kingdom. And Lord our God, when we trust in him, we let all other human instrumentation fall away and we know that it is you who is working. And so we give you praise, thanks and glory for the great wonders that you have done and are doing for us through Christ. Help us to trust in him and rely upon him in all our days. For we ask it in his name. Amen. We're going to sing again. This time we're singing number 248 in your hymn books. Hail to, Hail to the Lord's Anointed.
Let us hear our God's blessing as we end our time together. Now may the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain and abide with you now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.